didn't just get into Yale. He won a scholarship amount of $400,000, which is mind blowing. So I'm super, super excited to be talking to this guy today. And if, if you guys want to know more about how to get into Yale, keep watching. I was not really thinking about applying abroad when I was uh -huh. doing IELTS. Uh -huh. um, that's another story, but college applications started um, like February when I like started my first SAT math course. Mm -hmm. Saying, do you actually need IELTS to get into Yale? Reading was mostly about like text analysis and your critical thinking and analysis of like different arguments. So. In fact, having a mentor can be actually limiting. American colleges and liberal arts colleges specifically care much more about who you are as a person, who you are as a human being, mm -hmm. who, who you are as a th thinker, who you are as a writer um, and a reader. They care much more about that rather than just like mm -hmm. your, the fact that you speak the language or the mm -hmm. fact that you did the reading. Sacrificing sleep over mm -hmm. anything is worth it. At least that's what I think right mm -hmm. now. Um, I've never sacrificed my sleep consistently. Um, I mean, I, I pulled out some all-nighters, but mm -hmm. that was when I was close to like exams. I had, say, reduced amount of sleep, but I never on a regular basis, like cut out on my sleep. I think that's a horrible idea. Why you're wearing Penn University t-shirt as a guy who goes to Yale? As ex-member of Freshman Academy, mm -hmm. right? Well, would you like to talk about your experience working at Freshman Academy too, right? I guess since I'm like a teenager fed by those like hustle culture gurus, um, like Gary V, I don't know, the David Goggins and all those or guys. And Ender Tate. <laughs> Tate, <laughs> um, be like, you gotta have purpose, you gotta have mission, uh -huh. whatever, keep working. But for what? I mean, who cares? Uh -huh. Why can I not just have fun and relax mm -hmm. and be with my friends? Mm -hmm you are hung up on all these big dreams and ambitions you just forget to make the most of what you have now okay all right if, if you actually watched the whole thing all the three two hours well yeah. kudos to you yeah That's what I yeah say. true fans yeah yeah die hard fans die hard fans uh, let us show you yeah <laughs> guys uh, i we owe you a lot Hey folks, hey everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Adustria Muse. I'm your host, Muhammad Ali here. Today, I'm going to be talking to another awesome student who got into Yale. And on the side, this guy not, didn't just get into Yale. He won a scholarship amount of $400,000, which is mind-blowing. So I'm super, super excited to be talking to this guy today. And if, if you guys want to know more about how to get into Yale, Keep watching. All right, without further ado, meet Mr. Rustam Nur. Mr. Rustam, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So would you like to tell our audience a little about yourself? Um, yeah, I'm Rustam Nuriyev um, from Karkal, Pakistan. I'm about to be 20 soon. Um, I'm a rising junior at Yale. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, right now I'm mm -hmm. home just chilling, uh -huh. waiting for college grind to start again. Right, right, right. So before we get to that part, what do you say we talk a little about your upbringing? Yeah. Of right. So you you said you were from Karakal, Pakistan, right? Yeah. So what is it like growing up in Karakal, Pakistan? Well, um, I feel like it's not much different from growing up in any other part of Uzbekistan, mm -hmm. um, except we used to have salt storms there, but I don't know if that's like a big part of my upbringing, but it was very important to me um, at some point in my life. But before that, I mean, growing up, growing up in Karakal, Pakistan is about um, somewhat similar to Bukhara, I guess, about the desert, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. just being in the dust and playing football with and the kids. Plus you guys got the RLC. Yeah. Um, I, that's actually a funny question you ask um, because I don't think people really focus on RLC that much when they talk about Karkal Pakistan or when they, I guess, reminisce about their childhood. Um, Karkal, and that was actually one of the um, problems, obviously, that sparked my curiosity about like environmental problems and why we don't really talk about it that much. 
Um, I started sort of speculating, maybe it's not that important, maybe the problem isn't that big, but I mean, once you read some Wikipedia articles or just Google it up, Mm -hmm. you're going to see that it is actually pretty important. Formerly the fourth largest lake in the world, now almost gone. Um, So you think the government and the media downplaying this tragedy happening in Karakal, Pakistan? I, yeah, uh, I guess I I would say that, but also um, just, I guess, having something like uh, making RLC part of school curriculum Mm -hmm. would be um, one of the solutions that the Mm -hmm. government could apply. Um, I didn't really, I still don't really know what the, I guess, the single factor is that made people so Mm -hmm. um, unaware about the, Mm-hmm. problem right at your backyard like mm-hmm. uh like at all see so yeah and i mean it's not i mean once i went when i went to college i realized it's not special to like our calpax there are so many other places in the world where these kind of environmental disasters happen and the locals either do not care about it or even support mm-hmm a company or the government that's mm-hmm. sort of exacerbating the already existing problem. There can be a lot of different problems, but I don't want to base my whole personality and childhood on that mm-hmm. problem. We're talking about upbringing here. Um, it was fun. Um, I still, I mean, one thing I missed a lot when I was in college um, was just the stargazing mm-hmm. um, in Karakal, Pakistan. So actually, um, when I came back home to Uzbekistan in May, I brought two college friends with myself. They were high school friends and I study with one of them like in college. So that's how I got to know uh, the two of them. I invited them here. Um, We were working on like making this trip happen for like the entire academic year. Um, Yeah, We, we can talk about like the whole process later, but the point being, we came here um, and um, after our sort of internship that we did there in Karakal, Pakistan, I invited them to my place, obviously, and they stayed there for like four days, I think. And um, yeah, I showed them like what I miss in college, basically. Um, In Uzbek, there's this Malhana thing. I don't really know how to call it in in English. It's basically like it's like a cattle house is where you keep your cattle. Yeah, um, yeah. I guess that's mm-hmm. that's a. Um, it's like a farmhouse. It is like a farmhouse. It's in your backyard. Mm-hmm. It's not. I think it's sort of um, not very popular right now. Um, but Kakao Pakistan is a place like that where every household practically would have a uh, molhona. So, um, yeah, that was a big part of my childhood, just mm-hmm. playing with the cattle we have mm-hmm. in the house, the chickens, the cows, mm-hmm. the horse. Mm-hmm. Um, Can you ride a horse? I, I tried, uh-huh. but I'm not like good at it. Uh-huh. Um, I'm scared of horses. Mm-hmm. Um, they're kind of formidable. Mm-hmm. Um, What else? Yeah, all different kind of like but domesticated animals that we used to have. Mm -hmm. Um, And the big, huge backyard, just Mm -hmm. looking after that garden with my... I mean, we made a lot of memories Mm -hmm. with my like uncles, dad, Mm -hmm. um, mom, obviously, Mm -hmm. siblings. So I think that's the biggest part of my childhood. Um, Mm -hmm. Just climbing uh, up onto the rooftop, of the Malhana mm-hmm. and just gaze at the stars like mm-hmm. for a few hours and just wonder like what the meaning of this life is. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, your description right here reminds me of some Uzbek movies where they show village life and yeah. kids on top of the roof just gazing at stars or doing some farm work. And that's actually a lot of fun. It is like, fun. When you grow up in the city, it everything feels so superficial, right? Because things happening yeah. fast, right? You go to school every day. Yeah. You have to follow a pretty, you know, strict regiment. But when you grow up in a village, 
I grew up in the outskirts. I, mm-hmm. I not exactly a village, but I used to do a lot of farm work. I used to help out my grandparents mm-hmm. in the garden and took care of some cattle too when I was really young. And and all those you know memories I made with my you know family were around this our shared love of farm work. Yeah. Right. And it it put us closer and we didn't have technology, right? We didn't have phones or social media. And we grew up in, you know, so much connected with nature, Mm -hmm. which is so rare these days, right? Right? Some kids grow up not ever seeing a farm or or animals and they're missing out a lot in life. Yeah. And I feel like that is what shaped me as someone who likes appreciating like the little things. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't want to be like too abstract about this mm-hmm. or just drag people into this like boring mm-hmm. uh, metaphysical conversation. But mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, village life really, uh, the contrast between like, I mean, my parents are educated. They both have like a, a law degree um, and just, uh, but we live in like the deepest village out there. And it was really just funny to observe that and be part of that like experience and I would ask this my parents a lot I would be like look I mean you guys are educated um you guys I don't know have this and that job why wouldn't you move to like a city it doesn't have to be Tashkent but it could be any like close urban area Mm -hmm. but um they would be like oh this is like you know the the house the farm everything we got from your grandpa is like Mm -hmm. the stuff we inherited Mm -hmm. um they sort of respect it a lot Mm -hmm. and yeah and and my dad is the kind of guy who gets into abstract conversations a lot so he would ride me to like to my school uh elementary school uh during elementary school i was uh, in choresm it was like 30 minutes away from uh, my place. And um, yeah, during that ride, my dad would um, really like build deep conversations with mm-hmm. me. Even though I was like in second, third grade, he would break it down for me. And I think that was pretty cool. Um, I think that was one of the most important like parts of my childhood. Mm-hmm. I don't obviously clearly remember like every conversation or the details of the conversation, but mostly it would be about like just appreciating the little things and Mm -hmm. trying to do well at school. Um, yeah. And I think, I mean, he, he would show me that he would show me what's at stake. Like if I don't, um, study, I would basically not be able to appreciate even the farmland because Think about it. I mean, even the people who are in those like villages, I don't think all of them like appreciate the kind of difference they have compared to like people in urban areas. Um, I think they, I mean, most of them want to move to like a nearby city, Mm -hmm. but they simply can't afford that like change in their lives. Um, Maybe in terms of like, they don't want to go through that change when they're old psychologically, even uh, also financially. Uh, but the point being, um, when you have that sort of a contrast, that's when you start appreciating like what you have, what you could have had, how other people live. So my parents were educated and at the same time we were in a village where literacy rates are usually low and people don't really get into these abstract conversations. Um, yeah, they would normally look at it. They do normally look at it still as like, oh, I'm in the village. They look at it as a job. Mm-hmm. So, and I mean, you cannot really teach them life. You cannot go and be like schooling them and hey, look, you have this like great opportunity. And I mean, you get funny responses and like, like what one of my neighbors said, like I was like, look, this village is awesome. It's the stargazing and all of that. Um, but then he would be like, yeah, but we're also in deep poverty. And if you, which means if you keep romanticizing that, um, 
I don't think it's also any sort of productive. Um, yeah, I mean, what was even the initial question? <laughs> so it's your upbringing in Karakol books. Yeah, cle- yeah, yeah. Clearly your dad, you were lucky to have your dad because yeah. he, he was an important figure in your life who shaped your outlook on life, who very much shaped your yeah. character, molded you into the person you are, right? You're just giving him some credit. For yeah, I mean, being, not just my dad, my mm-hmm. entire family, my mm-hmm. grandpa, my mom, mm-hmm. everyone very educated. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And at what age did you move to Tashkent or did you spend your entire you know, life before you got into university in Karakal, Pakistan? Yeah, m- most of it I spent in Karakal, Pakistan, but also I switched schools a lot before mm-hmm. high school. Um, so that was that. Um, but I moved to Tashkent for my gap year. Mm-hmm. Um, before that, I was in Nukus. Mm-hmm. So the SAT stuff for a college application wasn't really popular in mm-hmm. Nukus. So I had to move to Tashkent where like, it was boiling. Mm-hmm. It was just about to rise. So yeah, that was like the big reason. reason. And I live alone there. Um, first with my uncle and his like newly established family Mm -hmm. but um then i sort of moved out alone because i could afford it Mm -hmm. um to like live on my own after i started like teaching ielts and stuff like that right yeah what was your first impression of moving to tashkent like how did you feel you know at the time going from a small village where there there's not much to see Mm -hmm. to a big metropolis like did you (laughs) did you find yourself and some kind of a shock, amazement, right? Because a kid from a small village coming into a big city, yeah. right? Did, did you feel like you were lost? I mean, I, I yeah, obviously um, the adaptation process happens to everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I guess one of the more peculiar kind of observations I made was... Um, because of the RLC problem, the salt storms and all of that, like respiratory problems are much more common in Karakal, Pakistan, and everyone usually coughs. And also because of the poor air quality, like you could even see the skin doesn't look healthy on Mm -hmm. like, I would not say majority of people, but in a significant proportion of people, it, the, their skin doesn't look healthy. Um, you could see, um, people really look malnourished. Um, so when I moved to Tashkent, it was, it was a contrast. I mean, people work out, people don't cough, people like look healthy, people look full of life. Um, people like strive for things and yeah, typical like metropolis, like you said. So that was the big contrast. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think that was the biggest observation I made and it was pretty shocking to me. Right, right, right. And when did your college application journey start exactly? Like, and I'm guessing everything usually starts with IELTS, right? That's the yeah, starting yeah. point. Yeah. You have to get your IELTS done and then everything else from there. Yeah, yeah, So, mm, My college application mm-hmm. process, I mean, if we delineate it with SAT. If we start with SAT, I started it February of 20... But you don't want to talk about IELTS chapter? IELTS chapter, I don't know if that was my college application, Uh like whatever part Uh of the whole story because I was not really thinking about applying abroad when I Uh was doing IELTS. Uh Um, That's another story, but college application started um, like February when I like started my first SAT math course. Mm -hmm. Um, IELTS, the funny thing with IELTS was I wanted to get in like Westminster um, and that's what I did IELTS for. Um, But then I realized the exam, the entrance exams for Westminster are like extremely hard. Mm. Um, Harder harder than Yale admission? Well, (laughs) To some extent, because when you do SAT math, I don't think it's as difficult as the Westminster University like math mm-hmm. questions. 
at least that's how I perceived it back then. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's not going to look as like insurmountable now, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, once I got my IELTS, um, I was like, all right, now we start math for Westminster. And then I asked Alisher to send me some like, uh, what is it, previous exam sheets. And he sent me those exam questions. And then I was like, wow, this is hard. And I started looking for other options because I didn't really like math and I was not going to spend six months preparing for a math exam for like a scholarship spot that I had very little chances on because I heard people would get like really high IELTS scores and do really well on the math exam and still fail mm -hmm. to get the, what is it? The scholarship, the yeah. tuition uh, scholarship. So I was like, look, maybe it's worth putting in all that effort into like going abroad. Um, and then I heard about, and I started Googling. I mean, that's how it starts uh, on YouTube, Google. I started like looking it up, like how to apply abroad from Uzbekistan. Mm. And then people post those videos. I mean, back in the day, there was, there used to be this channel called study America by like, uh, a Columbia graduate from Moscow, she would post a lot about this. Um, she would post like guides, free guides. And then I bought her like some paid guides as well. But the point being, that's when it started. Like one, after I got my IELTS score, new year starts, like January, I was doing full research. Mm -hmm. um, the whole month I spent watching YouTube's Google articles websites of like um colleges abroad and then i ended up uh, like looking up some sat courses once i realized sat was like an important part of it yeah and then i started doing sat and from where i got like contacts of other people who were helping out um with college application mm -hmm. i see so so you're suggesting, do you actually need IELTS to get into Yale? No. I mean, if you mm. get... Because SAT should be yeah, good SAT enough evidence enough. that you yeah. know English, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, SAT is enough. Uh -huh. But I guess you need to do IELTS because if you start with SAT, it's like you're starting with something extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to have at least like, I guess, IELTS 7 kind of level c1 to start like sat um yeah i don't know what in terms of like college application i don't know what you would need ielts for i submitted it because it was a requirement but once you have the high enough sat score you don't really need to submit your mm -hmm. ielts score um unless your college specifically asks for it right so most for most students out there IELTS is like a form of, you know, building their English. It gives them a structure. Yeah. Right. They could have just gone on to learn English in general. Right. But this concept doesn't exist anymore because there are IELTS schools everywhere. Oh, right. Right. So if you want to learn English, improve your English or just for fun, you can't really do that because everyone is teaching IELTS. Mm. Everyone instructs you on IELTS because IELTS has become sort of the, you know, the brand. All right. Right. So, and not realizing that, like you said, most universities, they may not even ask for language proficiency test scores, results if you got your SATs, right? But for majority of students out there, IELTS would be a good point to start, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, I would definitely say that. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I mean, even like native speakers, I mean, this test SAT mm -hmm. is designed for like native speakers. Mm -hmm. um, they take it, they fail in those exams too. Mm -hmm. um, so IELTS, I mean, those are two different kind of tests. IELTS is for like linguistic abilities. Mm -hmm. SAT obviously has a lot to do with your linguistic skills too, but also it's more like academic analysis um, critical thinking, mm -hmm. the ability to predict what the writer is going to see in the mm -hmm. next, say in the next sentence, the ability to um, zoom out a little bit and see what two arguments have in common or what they disagree on. 
So that has more to do with reading skills than just like reading skills, I guess critical thinking skills rather than just linguistic skills. But the, I guess, prerequisite to start that um, test is essentially IELTS because if you don't know the language, you cannot read it. Mm -hmm. So, and there's also like, mm, I don't know if they removed that kind of question, those kind of questions from the SAT, because when I took it in 2021, it was like three years ago. So now it's digitalized. The exam format completely changed. But when I took it, there used to be specific kind of questions about like words. So when there's like a sort of a complicated term or word um, in the, within the passage, they would ask you a question like, what do you think is like replaces this word best? Or what is like a best sub substitute for this word within the passage? Mm -hmm. So to know that, obviously you need to know the language really, really well, not just like IELTS 7, but maybe even like native level. So like C2, mm -hmm. basically. So yeah. Some of the questions are actually, they're tough. Yeah, they I, are I, tough I, questions. I, I tried SAT myself once. I got eight out of 10, <laughs> not 10 out of 10, because most people would assume that I, if I ever did SAT, yeah. I'd crack it in my first attempt. But mm -hmm. it's not that, that easy. It's not that simple, right? Yeah. Because there is some uncommon you know, vocabulary that you don't normally encounter in the IELTS test or in day-to-day -day conversations. And you just have to, you know, learn those things. Yeah. Even if you're a native speaker of language. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Uh, w would you like to shed some more light on your personal experience of doing SAT? Because yeah. students watching this podcast right now um, want to get some, you know, tips Mm -hmm. or at least some reference point, like go there, do this, talk to that guy, go on this platform. Mm -hmm. So, or maybe some suggestions, suggestions for self-study, right? Um, oh, self-study, that's mm -hmm. interesting. Um, when I did self-study, I mostly used Khan Academy mm -hmm. and I basically downloaded every SAT question from 2016, every SAT exam, whatever, from 20. 16 to 2021 mm -hmm. um so i and it, sat would happen i think four times a year so it was like something like uh dozens of like exams mm -hmm. and i basically like solved them all mm -hmm. um but now obviously there's been like years after that the format completely changed i would still assume that the logic behind the exam didn't change. They still want to see you as an academic, like, um, critical thinker and the text analyst. Mm -hmm. So I would assume solving those old tests still is useful um, because it's just been like three years of exams so far or two since the sort of reforms happened in the SAT. Um, I would recommend going and um, checking out the questions on Khan Academy. Mm -hmm. It's it's really, really useful. Um, but also before that, yeah, definitely work on your linguistic skills. Because without that, it's you're not going to really get a lot from it. Mm -hmm. Because um, what you need to improve on is going to be basically your vocab, um, grammar and things like that, even before like text analysis. So without those two, you're not going to be able to like get, uh, even understand what the conversation is about in the passage. So Khan Academy, that's the single most reliable source. I would say not sure if new websites and new platforms like open since, um, I took the exam, there, there probably are a few more, um, sources but yeah Khan Academy I would mm -hmm. fully rely on that and are you self-taught or did you have some mentors along the way I would say I'm self-taught on that mm -hmm. um I oh I started like self sort of teaching myself on it after I took it for the first time so the practice part was like I did it like on my own but before that, obviously, I had two really cool mentors who helped me a lot with it. Um, you want to give them some credit? 
Yeah, obviously. Yeah, was, and, and please, can you make sure you're speaking to the mic? Oh, Because yeah. I'm not sure if it's picking it. All right. Um, yeah. So I, I can repeat that part. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, yeah, um, the practicing part of like exam questions was um, like on my own. I did like practice questions. But before that, um, there were two really cool like mentors I had. Um, the first was Jacob. He taught me SAT math. Um, when we started our course, he was, I think, somewhere in Italy, like in a university in Italy. I don't exactly remember which. I think it was Politecnico Turin or something mm-hmm. like that. Uh, how, how'd you find out about that guy? Oh, I looked him up on OLX. Uh-huh. Um, uh, OLX? Yeah, that's that's essentially how I researched things because I didn't know any people uh-huh. who would like, share these things with me uh-huh. i would go to olx i would google i would youtube so um i mean i thought olx is a pl- online platform for second hand hand items oh Shopping. olx has everything everything yeah yeah um so you, you can look up tutors on olx i'm now. not sure if right now olx is as popular and as mm-hmm. like versatile as it used to be mm-hmm. but i found like jacob through olx mm-hmm. and jacob is the kind of entrepreneurial person who like would assume people from Uzbekistan uh, don't really have that many connections who, who can like personally give some contacts of people. And so he posted his like courses everywhere. And that's how I found him on OLX. Uh, really cool guy. He taught me SAT math. And once I was done with it, um, basically I was getting like full scores on math section. Um, we sort of stopped it and he was just like, just make sure you maintain your, um, score and yeah. But then he gave me contacts of Humayun, uh, who I think already graduated or he's either like a graduating senior or he's already graduated this year from Illinois Wesleyan university. Um, yeah, he taught me SAT English part. Um, his help was just tremendous. Um, I, yeah, he taught me the whole like English part, writing plus reading. Um, I think he was the only guy who had like a full SAT reading score back, back in the day, Mm -hmm. like from Uzbekistan and no one had like a full reading score for like a year or two. Like 800 out of 800. Um, it, it was the reading part. Mm-hmm. Like people would get perfect scores on the writing part because mm-hmm. it's mostly about sentence analysis and grammar. Mm-hmm. Reading was mostly about like text analysis and your critical thinking and analysis of like different arguments. And so he got 52, I think, all 52 out of 52 questions on the SAT reading part. Mm-hmm. Back in the day, it used to be 52 questions. So that was like really impressive. I don't think anyone has ever done that before him, had ever done that before him. And it, it took at least a year or two before anyone even repeated what he did. So yeah, those two expert guys, um, they were really, really like mm-hmm. knowledgeable in what they were doing. So. so once you got a handle on the basics, you decided to go solo. Yeah, because I mean, there was, practically like no point Mm -hmm. from hiring another mentor because it's mostly about, I mean, it's like IELTS. You, the, the, your, the mistakes you make will be like really, really clear. Once you get the answer, you're Mm -hmm. like, Oh, all right. That's what I made made the mistake. Uh So you wouldn't really need a mentor to explain you why you made that mistake. It would mostly be, I mean, improving your score would mostly be about your like, intensive lengthy practice Mm -hmm. it's not really about like someone again re-explaining everything that they already explained Mm -hmm. in fact having a mentor can be actually limiting right yeah to some extent i yeah oh now that you say it i guess because because you're not really pushing yourself hard enough yeah yeah yeah, exactly because you know that you have someone else does the thinking for you right so yeah um i guess both parts of my preparation were really, really important. Mm -hmm. Um, I would spend too much time on the basics if I didn't have these mentors. So Mm -hmm. kudos to them. Um, 
and yeah, the rest was with me and my buddies uh, doing like practice exams at the National mm -hmm. Library named after Navoyi mm -hmm. um, and having like sleepovers at each other's places mm -hmm. after like lengthy SAT prep days. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I made some memories during the SAT prep. Like at, 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 one, at what point do you realize you don't need a net mentor anymore? Is there like a number, baseline number once you le reach say 1200 or I could say the number yeah. once you're over 1300 mm -hmm. stable then you're good and also it depends on what kind of questions you're not doing right if it's one type of question that may you're that you're making a lot of questions at then you probably need a mentor to guide mm -hmm. you on that type of question because I mean yeah again it's just like a specific weakness you got mm -hmm. um, but if you're generally making mistakes because of a, inattentiveness, B, lack of practice, um, C, I guess, lack of vocabulary. Um, again, that synonym question. You would not really need a mentor. Mm. And also, it's about that intuition I mentioned earlier. Like, once you are sure you understand why you made a certain kind of mistake, you're good. Like, you can just practice another question. Um, and after like a month or two, once you forgot um, the first exam question that you did well enough, you can go back to it and solve it again and compare if you repeated the same mistake you made earlier. So once that's done, I feel like you're good. You can just practice and you'll get that score if you mm -hmm. keep practicing. Right. And I also think with most SAT students, they have the level of maturity you need to self-study, right? They, they're they more self-composed and disciplined and grounded, mm -hmm. which is something you don't have with IELTS students. Oh. They, even if they're on seven level, they still hold on to their teacher because they need someone to help them stay grounded. They need someone to discipline them. They need They, they want someone to push them against deadlines and... You know, interesting. Do you think that's fully about like IELTS or is it? I would say when it comes to like writing and speaking, you would mm -hmm. need like active like feedback process. Mm -hmm. For uh, sure. But you can, you can you can still be doing that with your peers. Right. If, so with, just like you self-studied SAT. With yeah. But the thing is, buddies. I feel like the difference, the huge difference between why you would actually need a mentor when mm -hmm. doing IELTS and not while doing SAT is because you don't actively produce anything mm -hmm. when you do SAT. Mm -hmm. You mostly it's it's if we sort of to make it more um, accessible for IELTS students, it's a more complicated reading part, basically, mm -hmm. because most of what you're going to do in college is reading and writing. There used to be a writing part. But even when I was doing it, it like uh, it was losing popularity already. Um, but um, it's mostly about reading. So when you're doing reading, you would not really need a mentor, even when you are doing IELTS. Same with speaking. But when you're actively producing something, I think you would need a, men uh, a feedback from like yeah. someone who does it really well, mm -hmm. like native speaker or someone close to a native speaker like mm -hmm. you, I guess. So I think that's the biggest difference. Um, yeah. Writing and speaking, I think they would really demand a good like a mentor and also I think it depends on the kind of goal you have if you don't want like a C2 kind of thing um, obviously you can just do it with your peers and get the whatever B level score you want but yeah if you want to get a really good score I think you need feedback from someone who actually got to a similar level right right and the reason why I'm asking all these questions is because SAT is somewhat of a new thing here in Bukhara, right? And I'd like to think that we are one of the pioneers, right? And so all, most of the students who come here have all these questions. They wonder what part of SAT they can self-study and how much of SAT they have to outsource, right? They get help from a mentor or an, or mm -hmm. an instructor. And something else I've noticed is with, you know, a lot of students who come here to do their SAT, is they 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 still some say they still really need a mentor not just to guide them instruct them help them with their questions but also 
you know, keep them sort of motivated. It just feels different mm. when you have uh, someone wiser, someone more experienced, someone more knowledgeable, and giving you that push. And because when you're a teenager going through puberty, right, you yeah. feel like you feel like quitting at some yeah. point, or you feel like you need like a reward, yeah, or you feel like you're working. you yeah. feel like you're stuck, yeah. or whatnot. You feel like you're not getting anywhere so that's i feel like where the mentor comes in and gives you that sort of emotional support as well mm-hmm. as the academic help which is what they're supposed to be doing and yeah and i'm not really saying that to justify why students should look for mentors out there because the other time i had left on the podcast he was talking about the importance of having someone guide you through the application process and and not, not everyone is really l- lucky like you or Levsha to have that sort of explorer mindset and not afraid to go and look up information or, or just, you know, take the initiative to do things, to figure things out on their own. Mm-hmm. Not everyone has that mentality, right? Yeah. So I guess that's where mentor comes in. Well, obviously I was, mm-hmm. I mean, mentored a lot. I mean, mm-hmm. throughout my application process and also like I- English, like linguistic acquisition process. But um, I would say self-study comes in uh, just from my experience. And also I'm giving really outdated advice on SAT because I haven't even checked the new SAT. So I don't, I have completely no clue um, how, how it looks, how it feels. Mm-hmm. Um, but self-study to me came in when I basically knew what the logic of the test was and what it tests and what I, what it sort of needs me to do, mm-hmm. um, which is a vague way of saying I learned all the rules. I just need to practice. Mm-hmm. Um, you just need to like live into, I guess, solving those um, questions, and that requires time and practice. So when it's only a matter of time and practice, I think that's when self-study comes in. And to keep yourself obviously like driven to keep doing it, um, I would say like a friend group, a good friend group helps a lot. That's how I did it. Mm-hmm. I had a really cool circle of friends uh, with him, with whom uh, we're still in touch. And we created this like group chat on Telegram. It's called Mad Lads. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Mad lads. How do you spell that? Mad lads. It's, I mean, M-A-D. grammatically you would spell it as like M-A-D-L-A-D-S, uh-huh. but it's uh-huh. Z just to make it cooler. <laughs> uh, okay. But yeah, the point being, actually it's, um, I love gaming and this name, the group chat name is, um, I stole it from a YouTuber mm-hmm. who uh, plays this game called Total War Rome mm-hmm. 2. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like a game about like, it, it just, uh, you're a general there, a king, monarch of some sort, um, just raising your army, building up your empire and conquering the entire ancient world. So there he, there you can name like one, um, what is it, one, I guess, army you have uh, led by like one single commander, you can name the army, you can give like a name. You could, uh, and, and normally they would have like generic ancient like kind of names, like, I don't know, followers of Zeus or something like mm-hmm. that, or th- some sort of that kind of thing. Um, and then this guy um, renames like his entire army into like mad lads. Mm-hmm. So. I was like, that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And then after a few months, we created this group chat and I was like, wait, let's do it mad lads. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's still there after like four years. So that friend group helped me a lot with SAT preparation. We would analyze each other's, each other's questions and try to give each other a little bit of advice and also like a um, support, obviously. Mm, that feeling when you're like, the whole friend group is done with like, a whole bunch of exam questions. And then, excuse me, you go out somewhere. That, that, it's, that, it's like an amazing feeling. You go play, I don't know, soccer somewhere. 
uh, PlayStation, whatever it is, however you relax and let the stress out. So, yeah, I feel like that's really important to keep yourself rewarded. Um, that was the case with me because I'm not the kind of guy who can work nonstop without any kind of reward. Um, because when you said like explorer mindset, I don't really get like a, the reward system working just because I'm doing something. Um, so when there's someone with me doing it, that helps me a lot. And also like something like a uh, relieving experience after that, that's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I deserve, like, I don't know, going and playing soccer with my friends. So the guys on that group chat, where did they get in? Oh, so there's seven of us now. Um, me, my friend Shahzad, he's at Yonsei, mm -hmm. Korea. He's mm -hmm. also on like a full ride scholarship. Um, um, Dior Beck, mm -hmm. he's quite popular on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, he's at USF. Is, uh, is he a guy from Navai? He's from Fergana. Fergana, a different, uh, okay. You can look him up, it's Dior Beck okay. Real on mm -hmm. Instagram. Um, he got really popular. Mm -hmm. um, Any chance I can have him on the podcast one day? Oh, oh yeah, definitely you could. Yeah. He's still in Uzbekistan. You should like invite him before he leaves. I, I will. Please, please get us in touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so that's three, four, Husan Boy. Mm -hmm. He's in NYU Abu Dhabi. Mm -hmm. wow. um, also on a full ride scholarship. He mm -hmm. was actually the first guy who got in college mm -hmm. out of all of us. Uh, he disappeared for like three, four months completely. Mm -hmm. He doesn't respond to calls, nothing. Just went off the grid. Yeah, completely like locked in. Uh -huh. um, in Namangan, doesn't even come to Tashkent. Uh -huh. Came to Tashkent, took the test, didn't even like message us, went back to Namangan right away to, to prepare for the next exam. Mm -hmm. Like he didn't even wait for his scores. He was like, I took the test. I'm going to retake it no matter what. So uh, this kind of guy. Um, and then, um, yeah, he got in out of all of us. And I think he was the trailblazer because after him, we really kind of got the confidence. We were like, wait, look, son boy did it. Um, and he was really struggling in the beginning because he was rejected by some, like, I think, consulting programs, like to guide him through application process. But obviously you need to be at some level to be ready for that consulting process as well. He got rejected um, and he locked in and completely like turned things around 180 degrees and he got in a full ride. It was, it was a very like extremely impressive thing back in the day. Right now, because of presidential school and all of that, NYU Abu Dhabi has like a lot of Uzbek people, but I think he was like one of like three, four people that, has, that have ever gotten into that school. That's four, five is, um, ah, um, Muhammad Qadr, he is like a data scientist guy. Um, he is working in Tashkent now, gets paid really well. Also cool. Um, uh, the last guy is Abdullah. Um, and also it's like a four out of seven people are from Namangan. Uh, he's also from Namangan, um, also doing some like work. Uh, I think he does like logistics now, mm -hmm. uh, goes to the gym really in his grind era too. Um, yeah. And I mean, looking back where we started off, basically like SAT, we were all in Uzbekistan right now. DR Beck has already in a matter of like a year or two, he has been to like, uh, 20 or 30 something countries he's planning to go to another half a dozen in europe in august um me doing my college stuff son boy he did his internship at like a, in, in tashkent at some political um like analysis kind of a org yeah it's pretty cool so what do you think all you guys have in common that make you outliers like what, what would you say would you could can you pin your you know success down to some qualities or traits like, mm. like if you could you know name three mm. like so lo looking back so we all 
seven or all five had this quality in abundance. Like we'd never had shortage of this, right? I guess I don't want to be like vague with it or cheap with it, but I mean, we supported each other. We were mm -hmm. like, look, this is the circle we got. And not a lot of people have this opportunity. Mm -hmm. Having like committed friends with you and not just one, but you have six best friends for mm -hmm. each of them. Like, we're as close as ever right now and it's only been getting better i mean we would not even survive it's not about just getting into college even the first years were so difficult first year in college is essentially the most difficult part for most people including for me and so to get through that first year of college i i mean i looked at son boy uh, his shared experience we were going through the first year like simultaneously, the Orbeck too. We're all on the struggle. We're like dying, nihilistic, <laughs> like depressed. To go through that era, like I have to give all credits mm -hmm. to the Mad Lads. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, without them, it wouldn't have been possible. So, I mean, if it were possible, it would probably would it would probably have been with much bigger like. Mm -hmm complications so so you would say yeah. it your success comes down to the fact that you guys had each other yeah right? exactly it's, it's the environment you guys built yeah environment of we were not people. together to do sat mm -hmm. like we didn't have any sort of like transitional end i mean after all we were just friends mm -hmm. and who happened to do similar things together mm -hmm. so yeah i think that's that and we it's funny because we also like talk about like big questions as well. Like we agree and disagree on a lot of things. Um, we have some fear fight, fierce like not fight but debates um, from time to time as well on on certain topics. Um, so yeah, that has made us grow as well. Mm -hmm. Everyone brings in some sort of news mm -hmm. from like what he is doing. Um, oh, wait, I left out the sixth guy, Don York. I'm so sorry, bro. I'm, you're <laughs> one of the most important people. Um, he is like a machine learning guy. He's in Duke Kunshan right now. Right. Um, a really cool guy. He's the funniest guy in the group chat. Um, always the author of the funniest memes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I got to know him um, at like a party event in Tashkent. It, it was cool. Um, he was also like a very important person in like, like in, in like depression eras, we'd be like, look, I'm dying. This exam is coming up. Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to fail it, screw it up. But then he would be like, who cares? Mm -hmm. We got each other. I mm -hmm. mean, we're, we're, we're going to survive it. We're, we're going to push through it. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, I mean, it's one thing when you get supported by your family. The other thing is when you actually have like shared struggle. Um, so I think that was also very important. Um, Donik is like into math, uh, doing some machine learning stuff. Really cool as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I know that college application involves doing things like writing motivational letters and extracurriculars. So what are some extracurriculars you did that you think made your college application outstanding and got you into Yale? Um, well, I think that is, I mean, the, if I have to like just point out one thing, it's probably going to be the RL region charity, mm -hmm. the, um, I, so I met the founder of this charity organization back in Tashkent at Ibrat Language Camp in 2021. Um, the first like few seasons of it, I was there and I met Robert, who's like my boss right now. Um, he, I, I, he presented about like his charity organization and the fact that he went to the RLC and did some like community work there. Um, and I was like, wow, people do stuff like this. I want to be involved in this. And so, yeah, World Origin Charity is essentially an organization that helps 
um, like disadvantaged communities were like essentially the victims of the RLC crisis. Um, we go teach like school kids there about the RLC problem. We raise awareness about it. We teach them like different like storytelling skill skills, presentation skills, um, English, um, awareness about like the environment. Um, yeah, install like water filtration systems and stuff like that. So there's a whole team working on right. it and I'm part of it. Um, yeah, I right now I'm in an, I'm an international, I'm a volunteer in international engagement. I, uh, and also I post a lot about the charity mm -hmm. work in my, on my channel. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of part of doing some media work as well. Um, also doing like the actual teaching, uh, and curriculum building work. And alongside that, I bring in volunteers as well. Mm -hmm. Um, like I did with my college friends. Um, yeah. So you think that was the biggest selling point of your application? Yeah, I would say that. Right. And also I did a lot of student union stuff when I was in high school, um, like student government. I uh, tried to like do different events and bring up new things into for the high school, um, like a club to discuss like history and something like that. But yeah. And how important would you say extracurriculars and in getting into U.S. universities? Oh, they are very yeah, important. Yeah, because I'm getting the impression that extracurriculars in your essays are, they, they simply weigh more than standardized test scores. Oh, yeah, they, they are way more than that. Mm -hmm. Standardized tests, I think, is just basically, excuse me, are going to get you through the filtration. I mean, people just have this idea of like filtration process. And I think that's fair to some degree. I mean, no one knows how exactly it happens or how exactly your application is reviewed, except the admission officers. But um, it's just going to show that you're ready to do the readings in college. That's it. Mm -hmm. American colleges and liberal arts colleges specifically care much more about who you are as a person who you are as a human being, mm -hmm. who, who you are as a th thinker, who you are as a writer um, and a reader. They care much more about that rather than just like mm -hmm. your, the fact that you speak the language or the mm -hmm. fact that you did the reading. So say I'm a ninth grader right now and I have two, three years to go. How much of that time you think I should set aside for extracurriculars and how much of that should go to my IELTS and SATs? I don't think you have to... Um, well, I think it would be wise actually to plan it out and be like, in a few months, I'm getting it, the SAT and IELTS. And then after that, I'm going to start doing extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you might be missing out on some really cool stuff while you are doing SAT. So I would not recommending like full on doing it the Spartan way <laughs> and like camping up and doing only SAT for like three, four months. Mm -hmm. I would rather, since it's a ninth grader, um, recommend like taking as many SAT exams as you can afford in terms of time and also financially because it costs money to take that exam. Um, so if neither of these, I mean, you'll have enough time as a ninth grader. So mm -hmm. I, I guess the first part is not that important. But if, but also if you can afford it financially, if your family can afford it, just take it as many times as you can afford. Mm -hmm. um, and in the meantime, keep doing like extracurricular activities. Start it as early as possible. So that's how I did it. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't because I had this wise idea in my mind in the first place, but it was mainly because I simply didn't have enough time. I was like, I have to do everything in a matter of like six, seven months before I apply. So I started SAT, I started extracurricular, I started everything mm -hmm. in like six, seven months. Mm -hmm. But also before that, before I even knew English, I have been doing extracurricular activities. So yeah, that's that's it. I mean, mm, yeah. Just a quick question. How many times have you said the SAT test? And what's the highest you got? I, I took it three times. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, oh, I remember the exact scores actually. 
the first time I took it, I got a 1320. Mm-hmm. Um, and with a little bit of practice over the summer and also mainly focusing on essay writing and extracurricular activities, I got a 1440 mm-hmm. in August, same year. Mm-hmm. And then in December, I took my last exam and I got a 1520. Wow. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that was actually, yeah. I, I took it three times. Mm-hmm. And essentially from like zero knowledge about SAT, mm-hmm. you can still do it while doing mm-hmm. essays, while doing extracurricular mm-hmm. activities. It's not highly recommended, right? but I would not. The, the, what I'm trying to deliver here to the mm-hmm. audience, ninth graders, like you said, is that if you just focus on SAT and IELTS right now mm-hmm. and not do anything else, say in a matter of six months, you get whatever the SAT score you want, including IELTS. There's so much stuff you could have done within those six months. Mm-hmm. Why did you just leave those out? Um, just get that SAT score by the time you're applying and that's mm-hmm. it. All right. Yeah. It's just sometimes kids worry about juggling all these different things and, you know, n- dropping the ball. Well, I would right. say micromanaging then. Right. Um, say you research some stuff about extracurricular activities, dedicate two, three days for it. Mm-hmm. The rest of the week work on SAT. Mm-hmm. And then like that, like just m- build for yourself like a micromanagement plan. Um, one week work on extracurricular activities fully. Mm-hmm. The next week work on SAT fully. Mm-hmm. It's just when you crop out so much time, like six months, there's so much that could have been happening within those six months. Mm-hmm. And... I mean, right now, people, especially right now, extracurricular events are happening a lot more frequently and new things are coming out a lot more frequently than they used to do even two years ago, even three. So, yeah, right now it's highly, highly, I would say, from my personal experience, I would not advise um, just like cropping out so much time Mm -hmm. for SAT and missing out on other things. Right. Uh, But anyway, I'd assume like as a ninth grader who's, new to this game, yeah. you would have a hard time managing time. And I guess that's, that's the reason why you need a mentor. Yeah. Like someone who's, had, who's done this before yeah. to give you a sort of a blueprint yeah. or like a signpost, go there, do this, do that, until you get the hang of it, mm-hmm. right? right? So, well, then I guess the compromise would be dedicate a month, mm-hmm. intensive SAT prep, Mm-hmm. Um, and then after that, you still need to start thinking about mm-hmm. SAT and doing it actually. Right. Um, I would say it's a big time of waste, mm-hmm. a big waste of time mm-hmm. if you just don't do anything but SAT over like six months. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe I was lucky enough to be actually like get the score I wanted and at the mm-hmm. same time write essays and mm-hmm. craft my application. Mm-hmm. But it's doable. I mean, I still had time to hang out with my friends. I still had time. I still could have done more, I guess. I could have gotten like 1540, but did it mm-hmm. matter? Um, or whatever, 1600. I could have spent like much more sleepless nights on it. But mm-hmm. does it matter? No. Once you are at, once you are sort of over the 1500 bar, it doesn't matter, essentially. Um, yeah, because it gets like, it's just a white elephant. I mean, it gets so much costly to get plus 10 for your SAT score. Like when you are over 1500, mm-hmm. I think it still works the same way mm-hmm. because one mistake like cuts 20 points sometimes. Wow. Um, out of all the, I mean, in total, we used to have like about like, 50, 60 math questions, 40 writing questions, 50 writing, 50 reading questions. So about 150 questions and you make one mistake and you lose 20 points. So is it worth like, I think at some point it just becomes luck Mm -hmm. and it's not worth just spending so much energy and time on it. Mm -hmm. Just make sure you get good sleep instead even. Yeah, yeah. That's actually what I was thinking when you said that I had a lot of sleepless nights and I, to all the kids out there, I think I'd say it's not really worth it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think 
sacrificing sleep over mm -hmm. anything is worth it. At least that's what I think right mm -hmm. now. Um, I've never like sacrificed my sleep consistently. Um, I mean, I, I pulled out some all nighters, but mm -hmm. that was when I was close to like exams. I had say reduced amount of sleep, but I never on a regular basis, like cut out on my sleep. I think that's a horrible idea. It, it really is. Cause yeah. it's just, uh, you are foregoing probably single handedly the most important recovery, exactly recovery ingredient for little extra edge. Yeah. And in the long run, you're going to find yourself having a lot of health complications. So yeah. it's not even really worth in it. the immediate, I get future, mm -hmm. I guess future. It's like, if you're dizzy, like sleep deprived mm -hmm. in your exam, you're not going to do well. However yeah. much time you spent on it, if you didn't sleep mm -hmm. the night before, you're not going to do well. Because I tried it. I mm -hmm. didn't sleep the night before in two of my three exams. Mm -hmm. um, and it was not worth it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I made some really, really silly mistakes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Going back to extracurriculars, like how do you know what extracurriculars to do, what to pick? Like, you think like kids should go with their interests and passion or you think there are some categories of extracurriculars that simply increases your odds of getting into university? Um, I just want to make a like small disclaimer here. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not really like a college application expert, mm -hmm. but from say what I would have done if I was a ninth grader mm -hmm. would be just do whatever is out there doesn't even have to be something i'm passionate about mm -hmm. is there something new and cool people are doing try it and if i don't like it and then and the standard i have for what i don't like is when what is when even when i'm actually getting better at it i'm not getting the reward so it was actually similar with like some data science courses i took computer science, IT. I took some courses, I was doing well, I started learning some programming languages, but I hated the process. Mm -hmm. I think it was a too, like, I don't know, too tedious of an experience for me. I, I mean, people like that kind of stuff as well. There are kinds of people who like it. So I think the standard for what you don't like, what you don't like when you realize is when you're actually progressing to some extent but you still don't like it mm -hmm. um and then I'll, i would give myself a break like a week maybe let's not do this and then try again after a week and if i still hate it i'm 99 percent confident i'm i'm not going to be able to like get a job with this in the future mm -hmm. because even if i got the job i would hate it so but also it 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 has so much to do with like specific cases um you have so much to do about like the subjects you were doing, the specific discipline you're in. Say if it's history, I mean, how are you going to discover your passion about history? Um, you might have watched like a documentary on YouTube and then you would be like, oh, wow, history is cool. But then when you have to do like text analysis um, and say you're collecting like... Uh, like comparing two different historical records and you have to like analyze it and I actually actively write and give an opinion on it, then you might be like, oh, wow, crap, I hate it. Um, so I don't know. Just do something for a significant amount of time. If you don't like it, give yourself a break a day or two a week, mm -hmm. not more than that. A week is probably more than enough. And then try it again and then see if you like it. Right. And I'm guessing you can also pass your personal hobbies, pursuits, and extracurriculars. Like, say, I'm, I'm a soc soccer guy. Yeah. I can mention that on my college application. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. And talk about the medals I won. Yeah, and the exactly. Experiences I had traveling to different If you were a really regions. good athlete, I mean, you can mm -hmm. apply to be in the varsity team of the mm -hmm. school. But you have to be, like, extremely good at it. Yeah, yeah. I can. Uh, yeah. Unless you're at that level. Mm -hmm don't make it like the center of your application. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's good that you mentioned you have like mm -hmm. some other things aside besides academics. That's cool. Like, mm -hmm. I guess 
musical instruments, mm -hmm. sports, really cool. Mm -hmm. You can even mention it in your essays, um, but I don't think it can be like the center of your application. Mm -hmm. Because after all, you're applying to a university. It should be more about like a, an intellectual curiosity. Intellectual curiosity. I'm glad you mentioned that. So because I was thinking like you would have better odds of getting in if you weren't just the, you know, academic machine. Yeah. Like most guys that are out there, they are they got amazing SAT scores, IELTS nine, or they got they got the best research paper. But you know, I was talking to some other guys who got into top universities and they, they were telling me like lately a lot of guys with a lot a lot of guys with impressive standardized test scores are getting rejected, right? And instead guys with lower, you know, SAT or IELTS scores are getting in because they have some unique feature in their application, something as simple as being able to play a musical instrument or something as as uh, rare as being able to speak a disappearing dialect of a language. Mm. Uh, but I don't know how that works, right? So and what I'm really trying to ask you here is, is like, is it necessary to have that feature aspect in your college application that makes you stand out? Well, yeah, because I mean, like I said, what is important is mm -hmm. um, as a person, you stand out like in the application pool and how can you stand out um, when all you have is just a high SAT score? Because mm -hmm. from what I heard, some published like articles, I don't remember the exact number, but it's still like a terrifying kind of a statistic. Something like three quarters of SAT 1500 or over applicants get rejected. Wow, we said three quarters? Yeah. Three quarters, that's 75%. Yeah, right. I, I'm not sure about like the exact number. Maybe mm -hmm. it was half, not three quarters, mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. still crazy that at least half mm -hmm. of like SAT 1500 or over mm -hmm. people get rejected. So that is not going to make you special as a person. Mm -hmm. um, just like speaking English doesn't. I mean, um, but speaking like a dying out dialect Wow, I mean that's that's special. Mm -hmm. um, I guess max something like a few thousand people would speak it. And mm -hmm. why did you do it? So as a person, it would um, show you as an intellectually curious person. You're into like linguistics. Mm -hmm. You are curious what special thing this like dying language has. <clears throat> like, I guess you could write about or talk about your comparisons of like one dying dialect, another dying dialect, and uh, a, a dialect that's getting popular or a very popular language now globally. What's the difference? I mean, and you could be curious, why is this language dying out? Um, is it just about the language or is it because the civilization, the community that, that spoke it never got big enough to spread it? Um, you could even connect it to like See, I mean, when you think about these kind of questions, you can connect it to any discipline. You can make it about economics. Say the financial system or like the economy of this community is so bad that like it never got to like spread anywhere, despite the fact that it was a flexible language, despite the fact that it was a simple enough language for people to learn, despite the fact that it was a much slim simpler language than say, any language that's popular now. So it could be about some historical accidents, anything. And you're curious about like one specific aspect of it or a couple. So that sounds much more interesting than an SAT 1600, for example, at least to me. Um, so yeah, I guess that's what makes an intellectually curious person. And by your high SAT score, you're just showing that you're able to read mm -hmm. like difficult papers and right. stuff like that. It, right. it doesn't say, it doesn't add anything else mm -hmm. to it. Unless you are from like a village in Uzbekistan and you got like a high score, that's impressive. Mm -hmm. I mean, admission officers are gonna be like, look, this guy or girl had so limited opportunities and 
they managed to get this SAT score. Wow, cool. So it's really case-based. Um, I think generalized advice are, I mean, get unreliable as you give, as you get deeper into details. Mm -hmm. um, but generally those kind of things apply and then you could adjust the advice I'm giving now to your own case. So, yeah. Right, right. It's, um, as someone who's never applied to foreign universities and has yeah. never been involved in college application process, I just find it fascinating, right? The fact that it's a sort of the, what do you call the reflection of the real world where you have to be a good problem solver and, you know, exactly. have your, you know, finger on different things. And there's also a big risk element, like unlike admission process here in Uzbekistan, where all you have to do is to show up and do a test yeah. and you get, you get picked based on your test results with foreign universities, you got, there are so many different requirements just as there are in the real world. Like when you're applying for a job, they just don't want you to be particularly good at the, the, your major. They also want you to be punctual, disciplined, or right, have all these other qualities or be able to speak multiple languages. And the admission process of foreign universities sort of mimic that. Yeah, and that's what I find particularly captivating. And also them. one uh, thing I want to add to it is that um, mostly what I'm talking about here is liberal arts colleges, Yale type colleges. Um, some colleges, like every college values one quality over like other qualities. So for Yale, I, I, I can't summarize it in one word, but um, I guess it would be something like... Um, Curiosity and open-mindedness and ability to talk to people. Um, just not, not even ability, just the drive to talk to people and get their views on things. Um, the fact that you're curious about what other humans feel and think about mm -hmm. one like same thing. So other colleges value other things. Um, I guess MIT values... It's not a liberal arts school, but values your like um, academic excellence. Yeah, academic excellence much more than like and proficiency in like physics, chemistry, whatever you're applying mm -hmm. um, as. Yeah, some colleges are competitive rather than mm -hmm. collaborative. Say Penn, for example, mm -hmm. would value competitiveness more mm -hmm. than collaboration it doesn't mean collaboration is going to be like a bad quality when you mention it mm -hmm. it's just that when you um pen is a kind of place that prepares business sharks um yale is more like community people for example mm -hmm. harvard i don't really have an opinion about harvard mm -hmm. but from my impression it's like decision makers mm -hmm. or something like that it's the big players mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. Like Wall Street guys? I mean, Wall Street guys are everywhere in every uh -huh. college. Um, so, yeah, that's generally how colleges want to be perceived, in mm -hmm. a sense. Um, uh, we want to talk a little about why you're wearing Penn University t-shirt as a guy who goes to Yale. Because I'm, I'm sure this, this is one question our audience has, has had since the beginning of this podcast. Oh, one, it's, it's a gift Yeah, um, to me from oh. a person at Penn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Right. Um, and I mean, I like it. I have mm -hmm. a Harvard like sweatshirt as well. Uh -huh. It's actually one of my profile pictures. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. I'm, yeah, that's, that's, I like, I like different like merches of different colleges. Got it. So what do you say we talk a little about your university experience as well? Right. right. But, but before we talk about your, you know, current experience at university, you want to talk about like moments leading up to getting into university? Like what was your reaction when you found out you got into Yale and you won a scholarship? Well, it was first the first of April. So it was like it was an April, April Fool's joke, <laughs> but also like the do words, colleges yeah. practice that really. Uh -huh. um, and then, yeah, um, it was uh -huh. uh, euphoric, obviously, mm -hmm. mm, to quote my mentor's words. Mm -hmm. Uh, but after some time, it just uh, fades away. Mm -hmm. 
And then you start thinking about like, oh, I need to do my visa. I need to start thinking about what courses I'm going to take. Mm-hmm. All of that. Yeah. Right. So what are you majoring in at university right now? Um, right now I'm a history major. Mm-hmm. Um, so sort of specializing in environmental history mm-hmm. and intellectual history. So, yeah. That's basically so what why, did you, why did you choose this major? Environmental history, it's pretty obvious. Like mm-hmm. RLC, I already took so many courses on mm, like different environmental catastrophes uh, across civilizations. And so it was, it was really cool. And I liked it. Intellectual history, because I'm into like, Again, abstract conversations, mm-hmm. um, like theoretical, I guess, discussions. Um, I'm into that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, what's something? What's what's one topic you've lately been that's that you found yourself obsessed with? Oh, that's interesting. That's something that piqued your interest. I haven't so, really thought about this. Mm-hmm. Um, something you got on your radar. Um, there's definitely like, I guess some books I want to read. Mm -hmm. Mm, I think there's still so much I need to read before I have like a full picture of say the history of Western canon or Mm -hmm. like the, the intellectual history of Eastern philosophy or something like that. Um, well, I don't really have like one thing that I recently, Mm -hmm. that caught my attention um well i guess if you uh uh, narrow down the question a little more are you you into politics do you do you like politics um i definitely follow the news you do right i uh, try to avoid like building or um sharing either privately or publicly like Mm -hmm. strong political opinions because Mm -hmm. i don't really have any strong political opinions Mm -hmm. um so what's the situation like in the U.S., you know, months leading up to election? Oh, and, election, and that, that, I guess that, 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 that was yeah. what I was thinking about lately. Right, and, and with, you know, the recent... The whole Biden dropout thing. Or Trump getting nearly killed, assassinated. Oh, wow, yeah, yeah. those were so. very, very... Wow, yeah, so, eventful times for U.S. history. Um well, it would be really cool to see the first woman president. Mm-hmm. Um, but do you think she's fit to run for president? Do you think she's fit to become the next I president? I don't know. Of the I mean, States? I don't really have like much knowledge about. Um, so you think she's- Kamala Harris's like political career? Um, I just talk to some people mm-hmm. in the States and they say different things about different candidates. And mm-hmm. I think that's how like elections happen. People disagree and, and mm-hmm. agree on things. Mm-hmm. So I don't really have an opinion. I mean, I'm not a citizen of the U S mm-hmm. so, um, but just my personal opinion, um, I don't know, like I, my like, cause you, cause you yeah. said, cause you said, It'd be cool to see the first female president of the United States. Yeah. Right? Would you say it's a rational thing to, a rational point to make about well, or, or support? If we just because, go into just, that discussion, yeah. I think Kamala Harris has a much longer and uh, like political career than Trump. Mm-hmm. So I think that's that. Mm-hmm. And, um, I I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, like I'm again. I don't really have like something to base. I don't really have like a basis, uh, like a base political philosophy to mm-hmm. support either of them. So mm-hmm. I couldn't really. If you asked me like, do you support this or that? If I said A or B, I wouldn't really be able to support either of my choices. But I think it would be cool historically to see something completely like never before seen to happen. Mm-hmm. That's first. Even, um, even if that means driving country into more chaos I, and why, more, more problems. Well, the question is why, um, I guess there's like complications, like why it would mm-hmm. drive like into more chaos. But I think Kamala Harris has like 
an extensive political career, and I'm pretty sure she's very, very uh, knowledgeable about like the the political, social, and economic life of the U.S. Not to say the other candidate isn't, but I'm. I would. I'm, I'm going to put it this way. I would not be disappointed or glad if either of them got elected. So, or not elected. Mm-hmm. So, in short, I would not care. I do mm-hmm. not care. Mm-hmm. Um, unless th- th- there's obviously like some effects of it on like international students as well. But to me, it, it just seems like um, I don't think it's going to affect me much. Mm-hmm. Um, as Trump, Trump's administration gonna make like visa process even harsher than it is. Well, I guess it is, but does it really affect me much? I mean, have I done any crimes? Like, it, I I don't have criminal history. I don't have anything like that. I'm already like three years into college. Is that gonna affect me? I don't know. Um, so yeah, I'm not really like a supporter of either of them. Right. It would right. just be cool. Right. As a typical, I guess, Gen Z expression, it would be cool <laughs> to see uh, like a first woman president. And it's not just a random person. It's yeah. someone who has worked in um, in the office um, like for a long time. I'm, I'm not really a, a Trump guy or anything, but I'm going to say a few things. You know, after the assassination attempt, I, I saw the video. I'm sure you've seen the video too, right? Yeah. And th- when he got up and put his fist in the air, he said, fight, 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 fight. Yeah. I just I just realized that he's just built different. I feel like he's like a natural leader, even if you hate him. Because for one, he's 80. He's almost 80, mm-hmm. right? He's, mm-hmm. he's old, mm-hmm. right? He's, he's getting Well, old. that's another thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Come on, Harris is much younger, mm-hmm. so... But Donald Trump sounds a lot saner <laughs> when mm-hmm. he speaks than mm-hmm. both of those other candidates combined. Mm-hmm. But again, I, I'm not picking sides here. I'm just an observer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the way I see it, I, I sometimes go on X, Twitter, right? And read people's comments and stuff. And when assassination attempt happened and people start, everyone started t- Twitter exploding. Mm-hmm. Everyone talking about it, right? And with Elon Musk, pledging $45 million a month to support Trump campaign. Mm-hmm. And, and then I, I go to the comment section and all the all people around the world, not Americans, they're like, uh, America's season two is wild. <laughs> yeah. Everyone thinks it's a TV show. It's yeah, a TV it's, show. It's an eventful it, it's, it's time. They, some kind of a clown show or whatnot. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. It, it's because you would not believe that video footage of Trump getting up and putting his fist in the air is real. You would think it's orchestrated, yeah, something yeah, yeah. out of a movie. Yeah. That's what I thought Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, for a moment, for a moment. But then when I saw in a later video, a guy on the stage getting dragged off with blood all over, I realized it was real. Like people were hurt. Yeah. Someone died there. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. I mean, that was pretty cool. It's just fascinating times we live in, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I exactly. Wonder, I just wonder what's going to happen on uh, November. When is the election? Th- th- I, I don't even know. It's November 3rd, I guess. Right? Yeah. Like, I wonder what November 4th is going to be like. November yeah. November 5, right? <laughs> that would be insane. <laughs> I mean, yeah, everyone's going to be watching live who's yeah. voting, voting for who and all right. that. Right. I mean, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's that. So what are, what are some other things you do at Yale you think you think worth pointing out you think worth mentioning like what what is Yale like what is going to Yale like it's one of the top 5 universities in the world right is it is it still in top 5 I guess around that right people call it an Ivy League school mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so what is it like being an Ivy League school student well um definitely cool i mean a lot of really really mm-hmm. um awesome people mm-hmm. um like your peers are going to be very very accomplished mm-hmm. and just observing that you mm-hmm. naturally are going to have like an imposter imposter syndrome mm-hmm. um but everyone talks about the imposter syndrome so mm-hmm. 
I guess the most fascinating thing for me was um, the people, again, um, has been the people. The kind of friends I made, um, the kind of people that I might just randomly see is just mm-hmm. insane. Um, yeah, it's it's a really special kind of place. Mm-hmm. And what are the things you find yourself doing when you're not going to school, outside school? You got any yeah. extracurriculars mm-hmm. you're into? I, I'm part of Commons. the Central Asian Society, Central mm-hmm. Asian Club at Yale. Um, so I dedicate some hours a week for that. Um, aside from that, I'm in the philosophy debate club. Mm-hmm. Um, and next year, I want to try out like the intramural soccer uh games it would be cool mm-hmm. i've been planning to do that since day one but mm-hmm. it still hasn't happened because of like scheduling issues but right now i guess if the schedule allows me to it would be really cool um then what um yeah that's that and i also game with the college friends there mm-hmm. um who share like the game tastes mm-hmm. with me so yeah and a lot of people know you as ex-member of Freshman Academy, mm-hmm. right? Would you like to talk about your experience working at Freshman Academy too, right? It's, a, it's an online support yeah. system, right? Online yeah. support mentorship mm-hmm. program. Mm-hmm. So how did, you, how did you guys start it? Like, well, give us, give I, us some I, backstory. I was a student at Freshman back in the uh-huh. day. I mean, the Valeras advanced English classes, mm-hmm. like helping with the SAT questions, Mm -hmm. discussing like fundamental literature and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, And then, I mean, I developed some loyalty to the academy and I wanted to support other students because I realized how amazing it was. It was really cool. Um, And over the summer when I'm free, I every like year I come back and in the summer, I do some, I put some hours in for Freshman Academy. Um, yeah, I, I basically just help people. Um, and over the summer, um, I was also part of Freshman, like participating in some events. There was like the recent UFC event, if you mm-hmm. uh, followed it. Like a, we went to the gym and did some like UFC training. Um, wow. We also did like an inv- event at Internation, mm-hmm. the English teaching center. Um, that was cool as well. So yeah, essentially those. I I don't really do any sort of like heavy work there. Like, mm. um, so you you were part of the. I'm just te- a volunteer, so yeah, to say. I see. Yeah. Like temporary staff. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So you guys, freshman academy operates entirely online or you guys also have some premises? I mean, in-person events like these mm-hmm. happen, mm-hmm. but the courses mm-hmm. are not taught like in person. Mm-hmm. So every year in the summer when Valeria is back in Uzbekistan, I'm back, Umid is back, different people are back. We do like a reunion thing. Mm-hmm. We go and eat out somewhere. Um, some events like the UFC event get organized. Um, and that's how we sort of meet up in person. Other than that, mm-hmm. it's fully like online. Mm-hmm. So you guys don't exactly have your own headquarters, right? Um, the founder Valera is, I think, establishing uh, HQ in Singapore. Um, yeah, his it's it's in the works right now. Right, but but not in Uzbekistan. So are we? My question is: Are we gonna be seeing? Freshman Academy headquarters in Tashkent or oh, any it's other it's it's an Uzbek product. Yeah, it is an Uzbek product. Um, it's just like uh, Valera uh, has been like a college student in Singapore, mm-hmm. um, just like doing all that. I'm pretty sure there's going to be some mm-hmm. like uh, another HQ in Samarkand mm-hmm. as well where it ignited. So yeah, yeah. I hope I get to talk to this guy one day. So what is Valera? Oh like? yeah. Um, I mean, he's, he was doing it part-time when mm. I was his student during mm. college. In the summer, he would help me. But um, after that, uh, once when he graduated, he, he took it up like full-time. And now he sort of 
is taking care of freshmen, helping students. Mm -hmm. There's like an established like a system right now. Uh, back in the day, it would just be like whenever he had time, uh, we would hop on a call and try to do different like office hours and stuff like that. But now it's like fully organized and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's yeah. like whole selection process. There's a whole like program process and all of that. I don't really like fully know the curriculum and all of that, but I definitely know that it's much more organized now. Mm -hmm. And he's like full time on it. All right. It's it's exciting to hear that there are prep schools, pre university prep schools like Freshman Academy, yeah. because students really need that sort of mentorship. Yeah, like to connect them with this university experience, like getting someone insider, yeah. giving them some information about yeah, yeah, exactly. some tips, some pointers, where to go, what to do, because it's a whole different world. Yeah. It's a different world apart. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's daunting trying to figure things out all by yourself, yeah. especially when you're young. Right. Yeah. So do you know of any other schools in Tashkent who specializes in helping students? Go, I don't, I mean, there's a bunch. Abroad? Um, I don't even remember the exact names, mm -hmm. but Mm, there's, I, I don't know. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I can't endorse any other schools, mm -hmm. but um, I know there are some other places that exist. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't personally got any, like, advice over an extensive uh, period of time from any other, um, like, prep, program other than freshmen so i i don't really know but mm -hmm. there probably is some other places yeah yeah or people can just look them up right if yeah exactly you interested. can just again youtube it google it <laughs> yeah <laughs> right right or alexa mm -hmm. yeah. or or alexa yeah uh, that was shocking that was my <laughs> when you said i yeah. met jacob on olx my first reaction was like what's jacob doing on olx yeah i was trying <laughs> to use everything yeah. i had because last i checked olx is a online shopping platform where it is it, it, it has products. been i mean always yeah. but i, I, can, I, was, I can now see they've diversified yeah i was kind of i mean olx is like they don't i mean you just make a post about something you sell it can mm -hmm. be any product so jacob was selling a course mm -hmm. so yeah <laughs> i mean and it's not like all secondhand there's new things to mm -hmm. so it's just like a it's it like a, turned into like a shopping platform. It was a big copy of eBay. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I haven't really used eBay much, but I guess, mm. yeah. Right. Uh, you want to talk a little about your hobbies as well? You told me that you're, you have your own project at Yale. Like, do you do, you do any sports? Do you listen to podcasts, mm -hmm. right? Or do you, are you, do you run? Because the other time I had mm -hmm. Lev Shaw on the podcast, he said he's into running. He does, he's done some marathons. So what do you do in the way of physical fitness or personal development? Because mm -hmm. a lot of students, people watching are curious. Oh, yeah. I, I go to the gym mm -hmm. um, with some college friends. Mm -hmm. uh, again, at Mad Lads, we track each other's progress mm -hmm. every now and then. But, um, but it's hard to tell. You go to the gym, right, guys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just started it. That's why. Yeah. Uh, I started it like a few months before my second year like uh finished uh -huh. so I, I was actually quite reluctant to go to the gym i was like mm -hmm. why i mean mm -hmm. but then um a friend from my german course at yale mm -hmm. convinced me he was like come on we should start this mm -hmm. um and he gave me a lot of like i guess emotional stability as well mm -hmm. um and what else i every now and then we play like video games, soccer, mm -hmm. the like, physical soccer as well mm -hmm. with some of my like Brazilian friends in mm -hmm. college. I'm really good friends with the Brazilian people there. Um, what else? But yeah, I mean, uh, some dinners every now and then mm -hmm. with different friends. I don't really do anything like pro or like near pro kind of sports. It's mm -hmm. just... I guess personal development. Uh, watching movies also something I picked up um, recently. Um, I mean, I I was not really like 
I mean, I watched all the popular movies that mm-hmm. Uzbek TV had to offer, but um, now I started, uh, once I realized my Spotify subscription gives me like a HBO Max access, mm-hmm. uh, which unfortunately works only in the US, so now I'm like on pause. Um, I started like watching different movies, um, recent ones as well. Um, with my roommate, I watched the German movie that was actually uh, awarded uh, the Academy Award. So the what was it? All Quiet on the Western Front. Mm-hmm. I watched it in German actually with my roommate, who's actually also German. And uh, for the record, you, you know German too, right? I mean, I that's I, I'm in, I was, I'm in all somewhat intermediate, uh-huh. but yeah. But you wrote profession professional. That's intermediate. Pro- Proficiency yeah. intermediate, but still. Yeah. So you speak Uzbek, English, Russian, German, and I saw Turkmen on your resume. That um, was, that's because I'm bilingual on yeah, Turkmen, yeah. Yeah. So many different languages, right? Well, Central Asian yeah. languages share some similarities, so yeah. Right, right. Uh, yeah, that's that. Mm, I'm also helping out now that you mentioned with some people reach out to me whenever they have like a linguistics project. Mm -hmm. They're like, look, my professor assigned this linguistics project to me. Like, and I think the professor would be really impressed and find it really cool. And I would, and I would also be like quite excited to do this, to do my project, final project on your language. Mm -hmm. Uh, for instance, um, I think second semester, or I don't remember, sometime in my second year, um, a friend reached out to me from the Central Asian Club, and he was like, look, I have this uh, linguistics project. Uh, I want to do it um, in on your dialect of Uzbek. Um, Oghuz Turkic, basically the Khwarezmian dialect, which I speak at home. Um, so, yeah, we did it on that, and I found some really cool, like, I made really cool discoveries on my own dialect as well. Um, that was fun. I help out every now and then with those like linguistics projects as well. It was like the second or third similar project I did. Um, so yeah. Wow. Does it ever do those languages ever get like sort of mixed up in your head? How do you keep them? Well, they they definitely do. Um, I depending on who I'm talking to. And depending on what language the conversation is on, I like think in that language and I completely block out all other languages. So mm-hmm. that's the method that helped me. I used to do something like, mm, wh- whenever I cannot think of a word, I would sort of try to, I guess, borrow a word from a different language and then translate it in my head. But that would mix things up in my mind, in my brain. So what I do normally is I just explain it if I can't use the word. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if that's like a phenomenon I want to describe or whatever. If I can't name it, I just describe it. <laughs> <laughs> that's what helps me to keep my mind on one language. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And with me, the way it works is I practically never speak anything other than English. Mm. Yeah, because if I'm speaking English, Uzbek, Russian, Tajik, all those languages, I'm going to get all mixed up. And I feel like I'm going to lose my edge as a teacher, as an English teacher. Mm-hmm. But I'm amazed to see Alicia switch from <laughs> English to Tajik, from Tajik to Russian, from Russian to Uzbek at yeah. such ease. Like, how do you even do that? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. that's a skill. That's a skill. Yeah. It's fast. It's just, it's, I'm just, I feel like a retard. <laughs> I'm <laughs> a retard. It's so slow. Yeah. All right. So before we wrap it up, so I set up three questions I want to ask you related to philosophy. Number one, how would you in few words or few lines describe your personal philosophy? So what's something that guides you? Something, the lens through which you see the world? No one cares. Mm -hmm. Literally, like, whatever you do, in Mm -hmm. the end, no Mm -hmm. one cares. Mm -hmm. And no one's going to care in, like, a matter of 50 years. Even if you nuke Russia (laughs) or North Korea? I mean... You can get away with that. (laughs) Some people forget about 
Genghis Khan. Uh-huh. Some people never heard about Genghis Khan, uh-huh. even though he killed like some, I guess, 40, 50 millions of people. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. you said in a few words. So mm-hmm. if I sort of start elaborating, we can mm-hmm. go talk about a lot of like nuances and but no one cares and um, do whatever you feel like doing. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So the sort of attitude kind of helps you get all the worries off your mind about social expectations. Exactly. Or, you know, living up to your parents' expectations or trying to, I mean, trying said, to, trying um, to fit one in. One philosophy that, yeah. one general phrase or word or sentence that guides me. Uh, but when we talk about different aspects of life, obviously mm-hmm. it would be like more and more like phrases and ideas like that in my mind. Uh, but so, so let me then rephrase the question: yeah. Like, what's your mission right now? Uh, that's the thing. Um, it's funny. I mean, we said like I said, no one cares, right? And so right now, I want to a little bit sort of free myself from any kind of setting a mission for myself because why um i mean i've been i guess since i'm like a teenager fed by those like hustle culture gurus um like gary v i don't know the david goggins and all those or guys and under tate <laughs> tate um be like you gotta have purpose you gotta have mission uh-huh. whatever keep working but for what i mean who cares uh-huh. why can i not just have fun and relax mm-hmm. and be with my friends mm-hmm. um be with my family or whatever without any like scientific breakthrough that i want to do in my mind right. if- or like without any sort of great political change i want to bring or social uh-huh. or economic whatever to the country mm, i completely have been freeing myself from social expectations, Mm -hmm. both like immediate expectations of my like family members and everyone else. And then when people say something like, oh, look, the fact that you're at Yale now means you got to give back to your community. I mean, yeah, but I have to think about that. (laughs) Um, so, So, yeah, that's that. Um, well, I am going to give you a response though. Mm -hmm. I guess making friends. Um, I, I, I like making friends. I love making friends. Um, the whole reason I ended up at Yale was, um, just being with friends. I mean, I think it mattered a lot to me that, and the main excitement I had from Yale wasn't even like, oh, I'm, I'm going to get like a great paying job or I'm going to like be the next scientist that changes the world or something. Those are more like, what do you even call it? Like side missions for me. I don't think those can ever be my main missions in life because I'm a little more like humanistic when it comes, when it comes to it, I care more about the relationships I build with people rather than, um, like doing something that society expects or like a, just following like a already constructed value. I feel like the only thing I can justify to myself personally is being with friends because after all, like almost every whatever moral standard different things that people constructed, different ideas, values, people forged, um, got completely destroyed. I mean, some survived a few centuries, maybe longer. Some didn't even survive a few years. Um, right now there's a new wave of like, I guess it's a very postmodernistic, um, attitude to have about life, like create your own value. Mm -hmm. So my, my value is basically making friends and talking to them. And then if something comes up, all right, I'm going to take it up. See, right. If I find it important enough for me that I sacrifice my time with very valuable people in my life, maybe I will do it. Otherwise 
no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm guessing the fact that you studied human history brought you to this conclusion, brought you to this realization that pretty much everything in life is temporary except for the relationships you yeah, built. Yeah, I would say that. Yeah. I was part of this. I, I did the directed studies program. It's like the hardest first year program almost across every Ivy League university. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically like a Spartan camp for humanities students. Mm -hmm. um, like a hundred students every year get admitted to it. There's like a whole application process. You get in college mm -hmm. and then you apply for that program before you even mm -hmm. start college. Mm -hmm. So I applied there. The whole like um, process I went through to just get in there was crazy. You have to apply there before June 1st. But I applied there like the day before the uh, the classes started, not even the deadline. Uh -huh. The day before directed studies classes started. So three months late into the deadline, uh, three months overdue. But what, what I did basically was I emailed my profs and I was like, look, I need this course. If you don't give it to me, um, I, I really want it, basically. Uh, and so they were like, all right, let's wait till someone drops out of the course. If that happens, like we will get you in. So I wrote the essays and I think the deadline was like 5 p.m. on a random Tuesday or Friday, whatever. 4.55 p.m., like still no one dropped out. We're already like 30 emails deep into our like exchange where I keep asking like, hey, did someone drop? They would be like, no, the next minute. And then after two, uh, like, Five minutes before that, I remember posting a story on Instagram. I was like, Yaleys, like Yale first years, please, if you feel like you don't need this course, drop it. I need it. I guess someone read it and 4.57, three minutes before the deadline, someone's dro someone drops out and then I get in this course. So it was insane. I don't think anyone has ever gotten into this course like that. Um, so... Basically, directed studies taught me a lot. It, in six months, I mean, in one semester, we studied ancient literature, history, and philosophy. We got to even like Ibn Sina and Farabi and scientists like that, scholars like that. So, I mean, I read a lot across through those, and we talked a lot about them in our seminars. And what I found is... Yeah, like what you said, basically. I mean, I haven't found anything more valuable so far than just human relationships. Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it doesn't mean I like quit everything and just talk to people. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a little too Socratic for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I ha you have to make money in this economy. Um, but yeah, but that's going to be my priority. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm never going to sacrifice. And I'm, I don't think I'm ever going to have my like grind era. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah, I tried to do well at school. I did this, I did that. But I never like thought of it as like the purpose of my life. I was like, all right, if I don't get in, I don't get in. So what? Um, yeah. I did my best though, within given the philosophy and time, money, all of that kind of stuff I had, I did my best. So that's a relief, the fact that you did your best. I can absolutely relate to what you're saying because I consider myself a bit of a people's guy myself yeah. too. Right? I, I, I think about always you know, making the most of every moment I have yeah. with people because I know Things like a big mansion or a mm -hmm. fancy car, mm -hmm. a promotion at work. And not say these things are not important. Yeah. Just is understanding that sometimes when you are hung up on all these big dreams and ambitions, you just forget to make the most of what you have now. Yeah. It exactly. takes away so much from the experience you're yeah. having. I mean, right? you could say, say if you didn't have either of you either don't have big a big mansion and a good car mm -hmm. um, or your friends. Mm -hmm. Say if you just have the 
big mansion and no friends who's there to like actually give credit to you and appreciate it say there's no people Mm -hmm. but you have a big mansion like why Mm -hmm. does it even matter but if you just have friends and and if there are people around Mm -hmm. there's probably going to be something else Mm -hmm. other than a mansion that people make up so that doesn't mean a mansion and a good car are unimportant it just means it's less important than people so yeah like I don't want to make my whole life around being a millionaire or a billionaire or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's cool, but I don't think within like my capabilities it is doable without sacrificing so many relationships with people that I got now. Mm-hmm. Because it's so competitive right now, more competitive than ever. And say if I want to be like a consultant or whatever, do like a finance job, engineer medicine uh whatever yeah i don't think i would to get to the level where i make so much money i think i would have to spend another like half a decade at least Mm -hmm. um of grind Mm non-stop grind and i don't want to do that while i'm young i want to enjoy my time with friends and i think i'm doing a good job at enjoying my time with Mm -hmm. friends and we want to do more we hope for that one guy who grinds for all the six of us. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. All the data scientists we got in the mad lads. Yeah. That's that. So if you could travel back in time, if you had some sort of time machine and could talk to your 15, 16 year old self or any of the 16, 15 year olds out there, what's one piece of advice you would give them? Well, I I think I would just quickly summarize what I just said. Mm -hmm. Like, in the end, you're going to realize that nothing is more important than human relationships. Mm -hmm. So don't keep chasing like a good grade Mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah, make sure you get them because in the end, that's a transitional end to make awesome friends. Um, But I think the level of grind or the level of like hard work I did Um, I think I'm going to be like, look, at some point you got to stop like working nonstop. So yeah. And the earlier you do it, obviously there are a lot of like nuances again, compromises depends on like the initial, whatever conditions you got in your family. Mm -hmm. Like if you are the one who your family expects to provide for the family for, I was so lucky to be in a family where I was not the main provider where I was not expected to be the provider. So that gave me the freedom to actually think about it. Um, Yeah, and now I have good friends. Mm -hmm. Mm, I have someone with me who's gonna probably be with me for a long time. So yeah, and now we just happen to be doing similar things and that's it. Mm -hmm. Those are not gonna substitute like people for me. Right. But I also think it's kind of a slippery to slope telling young people you should, you know, at some point stop or you should prioritize. Person- Maybe slow down. Yeah. Yeah. Personal relationships, friendships, because it may give way to too much fun, hedonism, mm. right? Chase yeah, of yeah. pleasure with kids, friends. Because I remember when I was in you know, my first two years into university, I had too much fun with my friends. We'd mm-hmm. go out, we'd chat, we'd play games. All wasted so many wasted opportunities. All of that, all of that time, I wish I spent on getting better grades at school. I, I wish I was a little more competitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the best advice would be to, you know, do everything in moderation. Yeah. Right. Try, try being moderate. Try doing it yeah. moderation. But there are times when, you know, you should know when you have to, <coughs> sort of go all in. Yeah. And be yeah, able yeah. to say no to family and friends. Yeah. Right. Well, there is like a set of specific things I would tell my 15, 16 year old self, given that mm-hmm. I get the chance to travel back in time and get that competitive edge over everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I would say something about like the courses I took, like don't do this, don't do that. Mm-hmm. But that's the big thing I said. And also that's not an advice for everyone. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not making a normative claim for everyone. It's just um, what I would find really important back in the day because I was like going through this whole um, phase where I didn't really know. I was curious, like, look, so many people wrote so many different things. 
so many people around me are saying so many different things. Like, this is important, that's important. This is not important, that isn't important. And I was like, what is actually the most important thing where I could, like, start it all off from? And then from there on, we're going to talk about other different things. So, obviously, I would not be like, look, don't go to college and just be, like, laying around like a, I don't know, like a veggie. But, um, yeah, I would... I guess say like just relax a bit because mm -hmm. I was really stressed out mm -hmm. about so many things. Um, yeah. Relax. The fact that you have friends is really important. Right. So because I, even if I had friends for a long time and I didn't appreciate it because I jumped from a school to school before my high school, I developed like really good communication skills and making friends for me was not really that hard. I didn't appreciate it. Um, I mean, fully. So I would definitely appreciate that skill. Um, being lucky enough to be in those life circumstances that I got to develop good relationships and being a little relaxed. Yeah. Right. Assuming this podcast is right now being watched by your future self, so you're about to turn 20. In three days, you'll turn 20. Yeah. But by the time this podcast is released, you'll all already be 20, right? right? So what's something you would want to say to your 30-year-old self? Well, probably what changed. And yeah. also to, to my 30-year-old. Yeah. Well, I would say, who are you with now, given all the 10 years? So, yeah, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Um, because I mean, in the moment you're sure the people around you are going to be there like forever because you're like so focused on what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. But then as soon as something changes, you're like, oh wait, um, this people is not really that significant in my life anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty sure like where's mad lads now after 10 years, <laughs> I hope no one died. <laughs> right. Um, Yeah. That's that's that. Right. Mr. Rasam Noor, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show today and sharing with us your life stories, experiences, mm -hmm. and a lot of tips for college application process. Like this, for me personally, was so enlightening because it's something I've lately been curious about. And I really appreciate you sharing all your insights about li life so intellectually enlightening, interesting. And yeah, I wish, I hope to see you on the podcast one day again. Like hopefully we yeah. should totally when I'm have 30? A, yeah, we should totally have a sequel one day. All right, yeah. if I'm alive, let's do right. it. Right, so do you have any final remarks you want to make before we wrap it up? Well, um, yeah, I guess everyone have a good rest of your day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. If, if you actually watched the whole thing, all uh, the three, two hours, well, uh, kudos to you. Yeah. That's what I want to yeah. say. True fans. Yeah. Yeah. Diehard fans. Diehard fans. Uh, let us show you. Yeah. <laughs> guys, uh, I, we owe you a lot. Yeah. So, all right, guys. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you liked our content, please don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. So every time we put out a new podcast, you guys will get a notification. And if you got any comments you want to make, please leave them in the comment section below. I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Bye.